What's up, everybody? This is Trey Biddy with Hogsports.com, H-A-W-G Sports.com. Arkansas coming off a big 52-35 win over the BYU Cougars, certainly a big game. Arkansas basketball just completed the red-white game, even some baseball stuff recently. Danny West is going to join the show today to talk a little bit about Razorback recruiting, and we're also going to have Andrew Ellis talk about everything going on with Razorback sports, your questions as well. All that and more on today's episode of Hog Sports Live. <laughs> And before we get started, of course, I want to remind you there's plenty of ways to watch and listen. You can always tune in on Facebook Live. If you haven't followed the page yet, be sure to do so. Become one of 100,000 Razorback fans to follow the page. Also available on YouTube. Throw us a like or a thumbs up on both of those channels. And on YouTube, hit the notifications bell after you subscribe so you're alerted anytime we upload new videos. And if you haven't checked us out on Apple Podcasts, then check us out on that platform as well. We're good when you're driving and stuff like that. Uh, throw us a five-star review if you haven't done that. We would love to have a five-star review say something nice about the show let others know what uh to expect from the show how you like it and all that stuff also available on spotify google Podcasts, stitcher anywhere else you can think of to find your favorite podcast and hog sports is just one dollar right now for your first month that's h-a-w-g sports.com 30 percent off if you want to do it for a year 30 percent off for your first year all right a few things to get to arkansas at auburn Two weeks, 12 days, 12 days. Arkansas at Auburn, October 29th. That game has been scheduled for 11 a.m. on the SEC Network. That's a good thing. You like to go on the road for an early game. That's a good thing. It needed to be 11 o'clock or 6 o'clock because Arkansas plays Texas in an exhibition game at 3 o'clock. That game's on the Longhorn Network. So Arkansas basketball. So you can watch Razorback football at 11 and then Razorback basketball at 3. It doesn't get much better than that. We might have needed – we might have needed this bye week just to get ready for that Saturday. So um, that's pretty good. Pretty good deal. I personally, uh, I've never seen Arkansas play an exhibition game against such a high profile opponent. So uh, it almost feels like that's a counter, but uh, it should give Arkansas fans a, a real good indication. I was at the red white game on Saturday. Again, we'll talk to Andrew Ellis a little bit more about his thoughts on that. But just looking ahead with the rest of the schedule, Arkansas is obviously by this week. Uh, they get Auburn um, on the 29th. Then it's Liberty and Fayetteville on November 5th. That will be the first game in Fayetteville over a span of five weeks, I guess, since October 1st, since they played Alabama. So Liberty and Fayetteville on November 5th. LSU and Fayetteville on November 12th. Ole Miss and Fayetteville on November 19th. That's three straight home games. It's a good stretch right there. And then wrapping it up with the Missouri Tigers in Columbia. Arkansas can win every single one of those games. I've said that before. They can win every single one of those games individually. They got some work to do. They got to get healthy. Hudson Clark, SEC Co-Defensive Player of the Week. How many times did I tell you guys in the preseason who are comp always complaining about Hudson Clark? And I'm not saying he's great. I'm just saying he wasn't the worst defensive back on the team and everybody's pointing to him like he's the problem. Said that all offseason, all leading up to this game. Hudson Clark is not the biggest problem. He's just good enough. I'm not saying he's great or anything like that, but he was SEC Co-Defensive Player of the Week. 11 tackles led the team. An interception, the first guy on the team not named Dwight McGlothern to intercept a pass this year. And a fumble recovery to seal it. Arkansas's offense really sealed it with a 10-minute drive. Uh, the preseason AP Top 25 for basketball. I know I'm going back and forth on a lot of stuff. We're just housekeeping right now. But the preseason Top 25 came out. Arkansas is 10th. They were 16th last year. Dick Vitale has Arkansas 3. He just released his yesterday. Torvik has Arkansas 17. Kim Palm 14. 24-7 Sports 6. CBS Sports Top 25 and 1 also has Arkansas 6. Same company, 24-7 and, uh, and CBS. But uh, – Arkansas getting, you know, getting ranked pretty high starting things off for basketball. You know what else I rank really high? Ozarks Go. I've used Ozarks Go for not quite a year and a half, but almost. And I've, I've, I think I've had three other – yeah, I've had three other uh, internet service providers. This is the last one I think I'll ever have because – they don't raise the rate on you. They don't try to come at you with some low rate and then jack your rate up the second year. Your rate the first year will be the same as it is the second year. They're going to provide great service. I always say I don't ever think about these guys, and I love that. I don't want to have to think about should I go unplug it and plug it back in again. It just works. I have had 
I've had personally 100% uptime that I've seen. I've never had an outage or an issue with it, and I wouldn't support the product if I if I didn't believe in it. So if you're interested in Ozarks Go, go to ozarksgo.net slash hog, H-A-W-G, ozarksgo.net slash hog, and you can find out if they're available in your area. You look at the top right, you'll see a menu drop down on mobile. You'll see an icon that says check availability. You can also reach them at 479 684 4900. That's Ozarks Go. Think north of the tunnel in northwest Arkansas and think eastern Oklahoma. And also, if you want them in your area and you don't think they're, uh, they might be available they're, or they're not available and you want them, just you can leave them a note and say, hey, we'd really love to have you guys over here. Very pleased. They offer a thousand megabits per second. That's a gigabit. And they also a hundred megabits per second. And that's up and down speed. So if you upload a lot of stuff, you got some really fast speeds on that, which obviously I do. I'm running this right now on Ozarks Go. So good product I'm pleased with. KJ Jefferson was 29 of 40 for 367 yards and five freaking touchdowns. 190.8 efficiency rating. Raheem Sanders, who they held out a little bit because he put the ball in the turf a couple times, lost one of them. 15 carries for 175 yards, two touchdowns, had a 64-yard run. A.J. Green and Rashad DeBinion had nice games, I thought. A.J. had 11 for 51. Rashad only had four for 16, but he also had four catches for 40 yards and a touchdown. Four targets, four catches. Nice job by those guys. Everybody knows I like Dominic Johnson a lot. These guys are are coming. Dominic only played a, a couple of snaps here and there. But those guys are coming. Really like what I saw. And, and really running hard, especially when they get in the open field. You see those guys running hard now. Matt Landers, eight catches, 99 yards, three touchdowns. Good job. Trey Knox, four for 66. Hazelwood had 42. DeBinion had 40. Keetron Jackson, three for 55. A.J. Green, two for 45. That's one, two, three, four, five, six Razorback wide receivers over 40 yards receiving. How about that? Now, I want to say I was kind of wrong on some things also. For all the talk about the Arkansas defense, you know, I was saying, like, they're going to just have to get lucky to get a stop against them and, and all that stuff. And uh, they actually forced a three and out on BYU's opening drive. I think that's definitely notable to point out. Um, you know, Arkansas gave him a gift with Raheem, Raheem, Raheem Sanders with the Raheem Sanders fumble uh, in Arkansas territory, and then they forced a three and out with a punt. So, I mean, there's a stop right there. Arkansas also forced a fourth and eight on the Arkansas 35-yard line, um, but the Cougars went for it rather than kicking a 52-yard field goal. They completed a long pass, uh, and really, um, it was a perfect. It was risky, but it was a, it was a perfect throw. Uh, they dropped it right inside there. Um, McLaughlin, I believe, was in coverage. Uh, on fourth and inches, the the fourth and inches try by BYU with 5:18 to go in the first half, uh, when Jalen Hall fumbled. I'm not so sure he would have gotten it anyway if he hadn't have fumbled. Now, he was lined up under center. I thought that this was like probably the game-changing moment. Um, you know, they they had a lead at this point uh, and decided to go for it on their own own end at the 34-yard line, I think. They had the, they had the lead. And so, um, so many things can go wrong in that situation. I get wanting to go for it and be aggressive and stuff. You just got a yard. It looks so easy to get. But so many things can go wrong. Your quarterback's not necessarily used to going under center and, in this case, fumbled the snap. But, again, I think the defense would have gotten through there uh, anyway, and stopped him the way that they got penetration. So live, I was thinking they caught a break. And after rewatching it, I was like, man, they uh, they actually made a pretty nice play. Then the next series, Hudson Clark made an interception with 2:22 to play. So this first again, the first interception not by a guy named Dwight McGlother. Uh, Arkansas also held uh, strong against BYU on the third and out on the three and out uh, on the fourth quarter when they uh, they brought up a fourth and nine at the BYU 26 yard line. So. I want to make sure I mention, um, you know, when Arkansas does a good thing. The final um, 10-41 of the game, BYU got its last real possession, um, and Arkansas stopped them on fourth and eight. Now, this was a play that a lot of people question, okay, because it looked like, you know, at least what the announcers were saying anyway, um, he, you know, he caught the he did call, catch the ball past the line of scrimmage. He was knocked backwards. But then to me, he reestablishes himself and also moves forward from that point. And I can guarantee you he wasn't wanting them to call him down because he's still fighting for the – I mean, this is a do-or-die situation. He's still fighting for the marker. So, to me, 
Yes, he crossed the line of scrimmage. He was knocked back. He reestablished himself and was battling to go forward and did go forward a little bit. The ball was stripped. I didn't think that he what his you know forward progress or whatever was stopped long enough for them to blow him dead. So I felt like it was the right call to call a fumble there. And even if it wasn't a fumble, I think he was still short of the line of gain because, again, he did reestablish himself. Um, the final drive was just a thing of beauty, wasn't it? All up until the end. I mean, Arkansas – I, I don't know that I've ever seen Arkansas run 10 straight plays, or excuse me, 10 minutes worth of plays, 16 plays on the drive. The last 12 dry, uh, plays of the drive were running plays, okay? I'm not so sure Malik Hornsby didn't get in at the end. I don't know if we would have gotten a camera angle uh, to verify it one way or another, but um, I'm not 100% sure he didn't get in. I, like everybody else, was like – I think I, po- I tweeted great period and like everybody was translating what I really what I really was saying <laughs> when that happened but a uh, good thing KJ Jefferson got up um, just has a stinger right back here on the back of his neck so um, just a great final drive by Arkansas I mean 10 plays or excuse me 10 minutes and two seconds 16 plays I don't I, I literally have never seen a drive that long so um, the first quarter flags, the Hogs were flagged four times for six yards in the first quarter, uh, including three for 45 yards on Dwight McLuthern. The first flag on McLuthern with 9.15 to play, uh, I thought was total garbage. Okay, if, even if it was interference, which it wasn't, the ball was so far overthrown, I think it would have been impossible for him to catch. Uh, the second P.I. on Arkansas was against Malik Chavis uh, with two minutes to play in the first in the first quarter, I'm not so sure um, he did anything at all to get flagged. I don't think he did anything that really warranted him getting flagged for that. Um, now, overall, I thought the the penalties, I didn't see but maybe one call. I'll get to that in a second. But I didn't see but maybe one call that maybe should have warranted a flag, but I saw plenty that uh, did not warrant a flag. And that's, you know, a couple of these pass interference calls. Um Let's see, McGlothern on his second intercept, or excuse me, his second pass interference call. I did think that was warranted. That was down there at the end zone. I thought he was jostling with his man, um, and and should have been called for for pass interference. The second BYU touchdown was aided by thirty yards and penalties. Okay, um, but ultimately, like they scored on a twenty-one yard run where. Cody Epps just pulled away from from Simeon Blair, and then and McLeather just didn't do a very good job tackling. Um, so all three of the first quarter pass interference penalties also came on first and ten. So it's not like they were all third down plays. Now there was a obviously a play later in the second half, um, and I'll get to that. But the the Hogs um, the Hogs held BYU on their first drive of the second half uh, and brought up fourth and four. BYU was at the Arkansas 16-yard line but decided to go for it. Hall threw incomplete, but Simeon Blair bailed him out and just steamrolling the receiver. I don't know what was going on there. But also, I'll say this, I don't know that that ball was catchable either. Now, Simeon Blair knocked the crap out of the guy on fourth and four and shouldn't have, but the ball was way past him, and I'm not sure I'm not sure he had any chance of catching it. So, um that put them at the three-yard line. They scored on the next play, I think on a jet sweep or something. But that uh, that closed the lead to three points, 31-28. Um, Arkansas benefited from a face mask and a pass interference flag on the next drive. Um, then Jeff, Jefferson hit Matt Landers in the end zone uh, for the second of three touchdowns. Um, this one was a 39-yard bomb, but Landers caught three touchdowns in the game. Uh, the only procedure penalty I remember seeing was Bo Limmer was hit with a false start with 5.06 to play in the third quarter. Uh, so the offense, I thought, did a really good job because you're going to get holding penalties and, you know, you're going to get, you know, blindside blocks and things like that that happen in the heat of the moment and stuff. But procedure penalties generally, unless it's Mississippi State linebackers clapping to make you jump off sides, uh, generally procedure, procedure penalties are, are mental. And that was the only one I saw, and that also was uh, was declined by BYU. So it actually didn't even show up. Um Let's see. Dalton Wagner was hit with a holding flag um, after a big 30-yard gain, which they overcame. Ended up throwing to Landers for the third touchdown there. Um, Back to Arkansas's um, 14-13 lead when they took the lead on that throw to to Trey Knox. 
So I thought this was a really well-designed play because you had Knox coming across and then you had and, – and K.J. throws really high. He has to really go up and get it, if you know. But did you see in the back of the end zone, Keetron Jackson was wide open at the back. So you had Knox at the front of the end zone with a high pass and then Keetron at the back. And looking at the play over and over again, I think it's pretty evident that this was designed like that on purpose because if the ball had been too high for Knox to get – or if he couldn't get up in time to catch it, Keetron would have – it would have hit Keetron probably right in the belly. Uh, in the back of the end zone, the way that uh, that it was thrown. So I just thought that that was a really, um, really well-designed play. I thought that there was a missed flag. I mentioned I, I didn't – I thought there were some opportunities where they shouldn't have thrown flags, but uh, I thought Isaac Rex, the BYU tight end, um, held Christopher Paul in a blitz that would have been um, – that would have resulted in um, Hall probably getting – not maybe not sacked, but hit or or throwing you know some kind of errant pass. I thought uh, instead it was a 37 yard gain to the three yard line with 10:28 to go in the first half, and then two plays later, uh, Puka Nakua was in the end zone on a jet sweep. So um, I thought it was. Uh, let's see. I mentioned the I mentioned the the uh, the bold move. I thought um, where they went for it. I thought I just thought that was. I I don't know why coaches feel the need to go for it all the time on fourth and short. You know, you're at your own – I think they were like at the 34-yard line on that play where they fumbled it. But they had the lead at that point. And they're like – there's 35 minutes and 18 seconds to play in the game, and you decide you're going to make a huge, like, game-changing decision right there. And I believe they lost the lead for good after that. So they didn't get – they didn't convert the down. Um and Arkansas had to overcome a fourth and tw- a first and twenty-five on that because they got the blindside block by by Knox there, or excuse me, by Bax there. But um, they went down and scored, and I, I, to me that was about as big a game-changing moment as maybe this next play I'm going to talk about because this was also uh, in the first. So Arkansas is up. Um, let's see. Arkansas is up twenty-four twenty-one. Right, this is right before the half. So KJ Jefferson made one of the best plays of the year. I mean, like ESPN Sports Center top 10 type of play. So this, to me, kind of gives some insight as to why Jefferson against Texas A&M thought that he could leap 12 yards into the air, <laughs> 12 feet into the air and score because he's also capable of making plays like this. So, like, in his head, maybe he is Superman. But um, he broke three defensive uh, – uh, broke tackles from three defenders and, you know um, – Found Trey Knox. Knox about six yards shy of the line, shy of the line to gain, and then um, ends up being like a thirty-four yard pass play. So to me, kind of gives you a little bit of insight into why KJ Jefferson thinks he can make some of the plays. Just a, a remarkable play. Four fifty-seven to go in the third quarter. Third and ten. Arkansas twenty-five yard line. Keetron Jackson goes in motion. Um, that helps KJ Jefferson identify the coverage. Uh, they showed they were in man. Uh, when BYU corner uh, followed him to the other side, and then KJ hits him coming across uh, for a 30-yard gain. Thought that was a really nice design play, as well as the uh, the play I mentioned earlier in the end zone. Um, the last touchdown drive, uh, last touchdown for Arkansas, the 64-yard run by Rocket Sanders, I thought was very well designed. Also, you had uh, Hunter Henry coming around, uh, kicking out the uh, the nickel. I believe Bo Limmer was pulling also, and there was an end crashing down, and he caught him. I mean, it was just a perfect – it was the kind of play that you, like, show future future players, you know, like on video. Like, this is how to execute this power play. So, um, anyway, thought that was pretty good. All right, I'm running a little long here, and I want to get to Danny. But, anyway, just a few of my thoughts on the game. For those of you who don't follow my man Danny West – Oop, there he is. You can do so at Danny West 247. Does a fantastic job. Been with us for as long as I can remember now. If you want to read Danny's content, though, you need a VIP subscription. And again, it's just $1 right now for your first month at HAWGsports.com. Hey, hey Trey. How you doing, Danny? I'm good, man. What did you going think on? of that game Saturday? Well, I give them credit, man. They had to have it. And had, uh, uh, everybody knew it had to have it and they got it so you know i do I, I give them a lot of credit you know when you're beat up the way they have been and you've lost three straight 
just got your butt whooped down there in, in Mississippi. And now you got to fly halfway across the country and play in that, that air like that. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's really tough. So give them credit for that. I thought Arkansas just had better players across the board. We kind of felt that way going into they it. Did. And yeah. that showed up, uh, especially on the offensive side of the ball. I, I do like that. Uh, what's his name? Pakua Nakua. Yeah. I thought he was a stud for them. I know he's been hurt, but uh, yeah, uh, outside of that, I, I just felt like Arkansas was more talented. That was the difference in SEC talent and whatever you know they've got in Utah. No disrespect to them, but there's there's a difference. But third downs, Trey. I mean, twelve of fifteen. I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. I looked at it this morning. Thirty-four first and, downs. Uh, I thought it was. I thought that was a mistake. That's a ton of first downs. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. But, uh, you know, 12 coming on on first. My goodness, man. I went back and looked this morning. I went all the way back to 2009. That's kind of where my my homework stopped this morning. But I only found one game in between now and then where Arkansas had at least 12 third down conversions. Hmm. And that was uh, 2017 down at Ole Miss. You remember Connor Limpert. He kicked like five last second field goals to win that thing. Uh, they came came all the way back that day, if you recall. But uh-huh. yeah, they went twelve of nineteen that day, and that's that's the highest number I could find so far. So twelve of fifteen is just stupid. I yeah. mean, that's uh, you, you're going to win if you yeah. convert twelve of fifteen. Absolutely. A star. Danny West joining us again. Follow him at Danny West twenty four seven on Twitter. And if you need, if you want to read his content, you need a VIP subscription at Hog Sports. Danny, uh, what's the latest going on in recruiting right now? I mean. Yeah. We're, we're, I know we're just like looking ahead to, you know, 24 guys and stuff, but what's going on? Yeah, it kind of feels that way. Uh, truth is, there's just not a ton happening. There's not a lot left for the 23 class. I, I know that's difficult to understand sometimes, but, uh, you know, they filled up with 23 going into fall camp, 23 committed guys. I mean, you're, you're full, you know, at that mm-hmm. point. So uh, not a whole lot left there, but kind of start looking ahead to the transfer portal. Yes. You know, I'm sure that's going to be starting up here in early December, and um, uh, they're going to leave spots for that, as as anybody would expect. You know, I've got a crazy idea. Maybe go get some defensive backs. Yep, I don't know if that's, if that's been thought what, of. Yet, what are you talking about? Just throwing it out there. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I would fully expect that's probably going to be an, an area uh, mm-hmm. that they're going to target. Linebacker is a little bit different. I, I'm being told that – you know, it's really going to come down to numbers. Of course, you're you're going to lose bumper, and mm. I would fully expect Drew Sanders to go make some money. But yeah. you know, crazy things have happened. But that's two big ones. I will tell you, boy, I like that Chris Paul. I do Poo, too. Who's Poo playing Paul, well? Boy, yeah. I like him a lot, and I like Jordan Crook. I like uh, the looks of Manny Powell. We yeah. haven't seen him much outside he of looks good. special teams, but mm. he looks healthy again. He's huge. I like the class they've signed with Carson Dean and Alex Sanford, Brad Spence. I think they've they've really upped the ante there at linebacker. When yeah. you, you know, if you compare it in the last decade, they need so. to go. They need to get somebody out of the portal, though, too, Danny. They need yeah, to get a, have an older somebody. guy. Hey, I, uh, I would agree. L- let me and ask the you. D line, of course. They're, they're, yeah. you're always going to get D linemen. Sorry to cut you off, but no, once I mean, you get into that cycle of, yeah. of getting three or four every year, it's tough to get out of that cycle. If unless you're recruiting four and five star guys to you know bridge the gap, and they're mm-hmm. they're not. They need some. They need some guys on the interior, especially. I think yep, um, yep. it's good to have a guy like Landon Jackson coming back. I mean, he's just a, what a redshirt freshman or sophomore, I think maybe. But um, hey, Danny, I wanted to ask you this: like, so every this is bye week, and obviously you're you're using it to get healthy. Yes, I am. You are. <laughs> what would you do in the secondary once you get Jaden Johnson, Kari Johnson, um, you know, everybody back that's that's been banged up? Malik Chavis, what would you? How would you line out that secondary? Well, you know they've all been beat at certain points, um, but I, I, I think I know what you're getting at. I've liked how Malik has played quite a bit. I mean, I, yeah, he's gotten beat, but everybody has. Hudson, I thought, you know, he's been. I heard you talk about him earlier. I thought he's been the most steady guy throughout. And uh, shoot, he gets beat too. Everybody does. Man, Alabama just gave up 52 points. Everybody gets beat, you know, but. Um, to answer your question, yeah, I was about to say, answer the question, yeah. Danny. To answer the question, I'm not a, in 2022. I, I've come around on this red shirt thing. Uh, I mean, after you see a guy like Jalen Catalan only play like 17 career games because he red shirted the first year, I know he had some injuries, but my point is if you recruit them, I think you need to recruit them to play. You know, if, if you feel 
if you've got a problem that, uh, uh, you know, something to address, I think young guys like Anthony Brown, Jalen Lewis, it's tough to, to keep looking around. Even those wide receivers that they flipped over. I tweeted the other day during the game, I would rather, I'd rather see a true freshman miss a tackle because, you know, maybe he'll learn from it and get better. And so it's tough for me to sit back and watch, uh, you know, same guys uh, do the same things over and over. But, um, you know, I don't watch practice every day either. I don't know mm -hmm. what the young guys are capable of. And I think that's kind of the hold up there. I, I just, we don't know. And, and when you watch missed tackles over and over and blown coverage and, and the injury situation being what it has been, man, I'd like to see them switch it up a little bit. But I thought Hudson, you know, played out of his mind. Slusher is going to be key, man, just mm -hmm. to get him back. Uh, I mean, you, you saw how he played when he came back there for a little bit. What was that, A&M? He yeah. just came out lights out. But, he was responsible uh, for three third down stops in the in the first yeah. quarter. I'm, yeah, when he's I'm going to answer the question if you're not going to, him. Danny. Yeah, Just, I, I did it without mentioning names specifically. So I'm going Chavis and McLaughlin at corner. I'm going Clark okay. at one safety. I'm going Kari at the other safety. Like Kari. And I'm going Slusher at nickel. And that's with yeah. the uh, – you know, with the one less D back. Now, if they go the th or one less safety, if they go with an extra safety, um, Jaden and, and Breeny may be kind of close. I may I may put Breeny right ahead of Jaden right now. Um, I'm I'm with you on that. Yep. But one of those guys, I think. And I mean, I hate it for him, but Simeon Blair is just not playing very well to me. And I don't mean to call anybody out, but you got to put your best players out on the field to keep making plays and guys who aren't making plays and are actually hurting you, I just – I don't know that there's room for them. I mean – Yeah, I'm with you. So, I don't like calling anybody out, but to me, Blair hasn't played very well lately. Well, I'm glad you did it and I didn't, you know. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, uh, no, I don't think that's calling anybody out, Trey. I mean, it's – you know, I, I bet if you put a Twitter poll, which I wouldn't suggest, but <laughs> you'd have a lot oh, of people God, agree no. with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I, I'm with you on that, man, and that's part of what I'm saying. You know, it has a – hasn't gone well for him and i hate that for him he seems like a great dude but at some point man you're you're seven games in about to be you know you finally hit the bye mm -hmm. week man i'd sure like to see what some of those young guys can do yeah. i remember when they and i go back to this here's why i know how they felt about them when they were recruiting these guys brown and, and Jalen. Yeah. like they're really really high on them so i always struggle with that when they get here and they're like well they've, they've got a long way to go i understand that but the current some of the current guys have a long way to go too, and they've been here four or five years, you mm -hmm. know. So, I, you know, at some point, I'd just rather uh, see something different. All right, Danny, you're a great guy too, but I don't want to see you in Arkansas secondary. Yeah, thank appreciate you. you joining us, brother. You got it, man. All right, we'll everybody, see you. Danny West again. Follow Danny at Danny West twenty four seven on Twitter. Does a great job. We're not having Curtis Wilkerson on today. Um, we normally have him Thursday. This is the only show this week, so. Um, we won't have Curtis this week, but you can check out on our sister channel, Hog Hoops Live. You can check out Curtis's uh, stand-up from outside the red-white game where he offers his opinion. It's about a 15-minute video or so, uh, just him talking about everything that he saw and also a ton of content on Hog Sports if you want to check out what Danny has to say. But I was actually sitting next to – wrong graphic. I was actually sitting next to Andrew Ellis, if I can find him, um, at the game, uh, at the red white game, and uh, he'll give us a little bit of insight. And also, he's checked out a couple of baseball exhibition games and stuff too. So, if you haven't followed Andrew, you can follow him at Andrew Ellis twenty four seven. He's been with us for two years now, almost. So, Andrew, how you doing, man? Trey, I'm doing wonderful. I am currently in the radio booth at Baumwalker Stadium watching mm -hmm. uh, some Fall World Series. I hope uh, Phil Elson isn't listening because I'm in his spot, but I'm. Uh, <laughs> About to watch this the, the Cardinal versus the White finish up this first game of the Fall World Series, and I'm having a wonderful day. It's great weather. Everything's good. How are you? I'm doing really good. Uh, Arkansas is coming off a win. It's always better to come off a win going into – any time it is, but especially going into a bye week is, and especially coming off of three losses. Um, hey, I wanted to ask you about baseball just a little bit. You've watched them play against uh, the Texas Rangers. Uh, what is it called, Texas Rangers what? The instructional league instructional team. league team and um, and I mean you've watched them a few times. What do you what do you think? What do you make of this baseball team? Well, so you know it's been an interesting. You know, so I've been here for all but I believe two scrimmages this fall, and that includes the exhibitions against the Texas Rangers last week. And 
you know, I feel like I have a, I've gotten a really good feel for this team. You know, there's so many newcomers and new faces that, you know, the, some folks in the spring are going to realize that they don't recognize as many guys on this team as they, you know, did last year with so many guys coming back. But mm-hmm. it's a, it's a really good group. And there's a lot of, this is, this is one of them. There's more competition this fall than there has been in recent years. Cause like I mentioned last year, they had so many returning guys that, you know, the fall scrimmages were fun to watch, but there wasn't much, there weren't really position battles going on because you had, a guy like Jalen Battles, Robert Moore, and all these guys around the field where you knew they were going to start. That's really not the case this year. So it's been fun to kind of watch these guys battle it out. I mean, Jason Jones is a true freshman who turned down a lot of money to come to campus, and he's in a, he's currently in a competition with Kendall Diggs to start at third base. And Kendall Diggs has been unbelievable this fall. He's been as good as any hitter on the team. And, you know, there's just battles like that going on everywhere, and it's been fun to watch, and it was good to see them whip up on a bunch of uh, – random prospects in the Rangers organization last week. <laughs> Andrew Ellis joining us. Again, Andrew Ellis 24-7 on Twitter. And Andrew does baseball, basketball, football, covers just everything. Video, he's a vid- big video guy for us. Um, so uh, we certainly appreciate having Andrew on with us. Andrew, you and I sat together for the red-white game. Uh, what did you what did you think of the basketball game in, in Barnhill Arena? Well, first of all, I really enjoyed getting to hang out with you on, oh, on the bye week. Really I, I didn't special. know I was- I didn't know moment. I was gonna I was gonna see you, and then I saw <laughs> Hawk Sports next to my seat. I said, "Oh, that, that must be Trey Biddy. He must yep. be going to the game." But yeah, it was it was really fun. And you know, the red white game. We kind of joked about it last week that you know, there's not a ton to actually take from it. You know, you don't want to formulate all of your opinions on the team based mm-hmm. on you know an exhibition game where they're playing each other, and you know it's not the most intense setting. But man, I mean, the, the biggest takeaway has to be Jalen Graham. I mean, 25 points, 10 of 11. I mean, he was scoring in all kind. I mean showed off his full offensive skill set, which, honestly, we just haven't seen to this point. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I've, I've had the chance to watch the team practice, I believe, three times now. We got to see them play four games overseas, and that skill set that Jalen Graham has really just had not shown up, you know, with the Razorbacks to this point. And, you know, this is a guy that was very productive last year at Arizona State, and, you know, whenever he committed, it seemed like a huge pickup at the time, but, you know, mm-hmm. so far it just hadn't seemed like that, but – Man, what a he good was all Pac-12. To... I wrote an article about how awesome he was going to be, and then it's just like <laughs> crickets. <laughs> he, he, maybe he saw you yeah. show up, and he said, "Wait a minute, Trey Biddy's here. I've, I've got to, I've got to step up my game." That's maybe what that's happened. what happened. But, but man, yeah, it's you know, they're they're that's one of the big question marks on the team is do they have anyone who can kind of fill that five spot, and maybe you know he can do something like that. I know he's not really a true traditional five man, but you know they have kind of an open spot there that. They're looking for minutes with the big man. They're looking for someone to emerge. And what better way to emerge than knocking down 10 of 11 field goals and scoring 25 points? Yeah. Uh, 64-59, the, the red over the white. Nick Smith really started to take over there towards the, towards the end of the game. I think he entered the fourth quarter – with like 11 points or something like that and maybe scored 11 more in the, in the fourth quarter. I think something like that. Yeah, I mean, I remember you leaned over to me and said, I, I, you know, it'd be really cool to see Nick Smith kind of take over right here. And I think he hit, like, his next three shots, two yeah. of which were threes, and just kind of did exactly what you said. And, you know, that's obviously just the kind of stuff you expect from a guy like that with his pedigree, you know, with his talent. Man, it's just – it's it's you know, you get to really kind of see flashes of the capability that he has and kind of just that mentality, that, mm-hmm. you know, alpha killer mentality that he has. And, man, he just – the way he carries himself, he just doesn't seem like a freshman. And so – I know that some people may, you know, be a little worried about, oh, you're leaning on freshmen to carry much of a load, but that's one guy I just, I just am not going to worry about this season at all. But, and I think uh, Anthony Black is another one that really, I mean, I wrote an article about him after the game. He's one that just, his play style, he just, it's easy to play with a guy like that, you know, and he's obviously I mean, sometimes almost unselfish to a fault offensively where he's not looking for a shot as much. I think he only took three shots yesterday, but man, you can just see that it's fun to play with a guy like that and, you know, his size at the point guard spot is just kind of a really unique player. And, you know, must said after the game, there's just really not many guys in college basketball who can do the things that he can do. And I think he's going to be a really fun piece to watch and kind of see him grow and evolve throughout the year. I'm going to throw some information towards you, Andrew, and listeners too, because you used a term called alpha. Did you know that when that, that the, the term comes from this guy who studied wolves, right? And, what he found out later after he published his book, he retracted it and all the stuff about the alpha stuff. All alpha is with a wolf pack is really a, the grandfather father 
of all the other wolves in the pack. It's just the oldest. It's just like any other family dynamic. He's not like, um, you know, beating out somebody to win the title of, of alpha. But despite his pleas and everything to get people to stop saying that, to re, you know, and retract it, the book is still pub, being published with the incorrect information that there is an alpha wolf. So educating well that's exactly that. what i that's exactly what i meant he's the grandfather of the wolf pack <laughs> of the, the razorback roster that's exactly what i meant <laughs> he's the grandfather gotcha <laughs> anyway I, every time i hear that i have to i have to go into that so um what are you doing on the bye week andrew well so far you know I, like i mentioned the fall world series game once today they'll have mm-hmm. game two tomorrow at uh, 1 p.m and then thursday if necessary so i'll watch a little bit of baseball probably write some things about that uh really you know there's not much going on and i'm I'm happy that the bye week you know that arkansas i'm you know not saying that i'm happy arkansas is winning but the vibe is definitely a lot better than it would have been if oh god you know we were having i mean sam Pittman. it was so funny to hear him mention that after the game where could you imagine if we had lost and i had to get on the plane and read all these things i I just thought that was so funny but yeah now it's interesting to kind of look ahead to the second half of this football season Mm -hmm. because all of a sudden now you get your guys healthy some guys are coming back in the secondary hopefully i mean Pittman said he's hoping they can get almost everybody back you know than the guys that are out for the year so now like you and danny you know you're playing the game of trying to figure out where everyone goes and now it's almost like arkansas has options which is the, the something they haven't had lately so it's gonna be interesting to start to look ahead and kind of see what this Arkansas team can do down the stretch. You know, I think it's interesting also. They can, they've can they got five winnable games. They can win all of them. Ole Miss is going to be tough, right? But they get them in Fayetteville, all right? And there's a lot to be said for that. LSU be tough. They get them in Fayetteville. Um, but if Arkansas goes four and one, which is very possible, they will have the same uh, record that they had last year. And I always think it's interesting because people are like this. Somebody said – Somebody tweeted at me in the first quarter or first half of the game, this team has quit. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, it's just interesting for me because, like, people come up with their predictions. Nine wins was a very popular prediction. I think you, me, Curtis, all predicted nine wins uh, for this season. A lot of fans did. Some pe- people picked eight. And it's all very possible. But when you get into the thick of it, into the season, the reaction of people – when they lose a game or they don't play well or something, is just like, this team's pathetic. But going into the season, you bought season tickets. You are invested. You're talking to your buddies about how hyped you are. You're calling into radio shows. You know, you're listening. You're excited about the season start because Arkansas has got a shot to win nine games. You yeah, know? I mean, it's, but in, it's the, in the season, yeah. it's just like, oh, my God, they're terrible. Well, and at this point, you know, I think – I don't remember what we had game by game, but I remember the only game I the games I had them losing to this point in the season were Mississippi State and Alabama. I believe I had them five and two. And you look at that, and we're a missed field goal away from that being the reality. Yeah. As bad as everything has been, as we you know, amidst all the injuries and all the inconsistency and the struggles and the KJ going down, they're a field goal away from being five and two, which is where I'd say a lot of us kind of envision them being at this point and you know i also had them drop in that old miss game you get that one back then all of a sudden you're nine and three which is exactly where mm-hmm. we all expect you know the, the, it, it just kind of is that way and you know it's funny week to week how the perception just changes so drastically you know like byu is a pretty good football team so like you know if you lose to and i think the spread was one point so yeah. it was literally pretty much a coin flip you know according to vegas I you know, and if Arkansas had lost that game, just the perception and the vibe would be so completely different. Whereas it really, like you said, it's just not week to week. It just isn't that reactionary, and it really is not. Not everything is that big of a deal. But yeah, you know how it is. We have to live and die with every play, and That's what every makes it play fun. is, is I, yeah, I, absolutely. I just wish so much of the venom <laughs> wasn't there, you know. But uh, I, I'm a hundred percent right there with everybody else, just living and dying on every play, and it's what I love about football. Absolutely, that's that's why we do what we do. It's 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 brilliant and horrible and also brilliant yep. at the same time. Just like that uh, that field goal uh, for Tennessee, the uh, most beautiful, oh, ugly yeah. field goal uh, Tennessee fans have ever seen. All right, Andrew, appreciate you, man. All right, thank you so much. All right, everybody, Andrew Ellis, twenty four seven Sports beat writer, covers all aspects of Razorback sports. You can follow him at Andrew Ellis twenty four seven, and um, yeah, he covers everything. Where do we want to go? 
I'll tell you where we're not going. We're not going to a new internet service provider because we have Ozarks Go, which has been fantastic. If you have somebody, like if you're maybe a person that doesn't really understand internet and computers and stuff, but you have internet and you're like, you know, it's, it keeps going in and out. You can't figure it out. And you're like, well, let me call my internet guy. You don't need an internet guy. You just need Ozarks Go. Ozarks Go will just work for you. Wouldn't that be great? Work for your friends. Your friends come over and it just works. You don't ever have to worry about it. You don't have to unplug it and plug it back in. That's what you get with Ozarks Go. Go to ozarksgo.net slash hog, H-A-W-G, and you can find out more information there if they're available in your area. So think northeast Oklahoma. Think uh, north of the tunnel in uh, northwest Arkansas. Those are the areas that you're going to find Ozarks Go. And you can go check out them at their website, Ozarks Go. And that's plural sounding, so it's Ozarks Go. Ozarksgo.net slash h-a-w-g and you can check availability there you can also leave them a message that, hey, i'd love to have you come in my area because they're they're expanding they're growing they've been doing that over the last several years but have not thought about those guys since they came and installed it so that's what you want they're not going to jack your prices up you're going to get 100 up and 100 down megabits per second that's plenty fast but if you're a guy like me or you like it really really fast i use a thousand up and down thousand megabits per second up and down that's basically instant it's basically instant and uh it's been fantastic. That cord has never been unplugged in the last, what, 14 months or so. It has never, more than that, maybe like 16 months, it has never been unplugged it, from the time they put it in there. It's never been unplugged. Like, you know what I'm talking about. Like, unplug it and plug it back in. None of that stuff. So go check out my friends at Ozarks Go. You'll be pleased that you did. They're not going to jack your price up in year two either. They're just going to give you a good, honest price. And it's going to be the same price the next year. Trey Biddy stamp of approval for Ozarks Go. Let's get to a couple questions real fast. We started late today. Arkansas has done well with recruiting on the offensive side of the ball and good with, with defensive transfers. When will we see better recruiting on the defensive side of the ball? It's a good question. Uh, I feel like they've got some good young players on defense. It's just – it takes a little while, I guess, to, to grow up and get more mature. I mean, like, you know, guys like Cameron Ball, that's a that's a nice player for him. Um, Jordan Crook, Manny Powell, I think, will prove to be a good player. You know, he's coming off that ACL injury last year. Um, Christopher Paul, I think, is another good young player. They, they need some help in the secondary. I mean, they've got a couple of guys here, and you know, like Anthony Brown, I think, um, you know, I think he was a nice get for him, but – I'd also like to see Samuel Bakke stick at cornerback, maybe McAdoo. I think I like McAdoo, I think, at wide receiver. But maybe Bakke could – I don't know. He could do either one if he wants. I mean, they told him he could, but I wouldn't mind seeing him stick at cornerback. Zachary Hall says, KJ's moment where he broke the tackles and converted the third and long seemed like a breakthrough moment for the team. Yep. Maybe it will translate. I think it could have as big a moment as that – the K.J. leap that fumbled went 97 yards in terms of a negative play. This one in terms of a positive turning things around. I think you're right, Zachary Hall, Arkansas Storm Tracker. Dubinia is going to be a premier SEC RB in the future. Yeah, he's pretty good. He reminds me of Eric Gray a little bit. It was at Tennessee and then um, went over to Oklahoma. I wonder if Gray wishes he was still at Tennessee. Jake Belk says, Trey, what's the word on D. Johnson? Is he just not healthy? I, I would think he's probably just not healthy enough to that they feel like they can use him a lot. But at the same time, you know, those two backs do provide a nice change of pace from Rocket Sanders. Maybe that's what it is. I still am a fan. I think that he deserves more carries, but just the way it is. Donnie A. Butt says, BYU coach said he was trying to lure the defense off sides. Uh, the center was never supposed to snap the ball on the 34. Is that right? I did not hear that. Is that right, Donnie? That makes a lot more sense. Thank you for clarifying that for me because I just thought he was being ludicrous for going for it there when you are, I mean, but, I mean, teams make mistakes. You capitalize on mistakes. Arkansas went down there and scored. Again, that's what it's all about. We talk about offense line versus their D-line, run game versus run defense, pass versus run – you know, pass versus pass D, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, so much of college football is just teams screwing up and the other team capitalizing. And that's what Arkansas did there. It was a game-changing moment. Landon Montgomery. 
a week a week removed or yeah, you know, about a week removed from your birthday, Landon. Today's Trey Biddy birthday week. Excited. It's a good week to have a birthday because I feel like Arkansas always loses on my birthday week. <laughs> and so it's a buy. So that's a good thing. Another good universe working in Arkansas's favor. Where'd we go? Landon says, Trey, were our expectations too high to begin the season? Ten and three. Still a great season. I truly thought we'd be having Tennessee's season. Um, I didn't pick them to win ten. I pick, well, I did, I mean, they can win ten with a bowl game. I said we just picked nine, you know, regular season. I said nine, which is obviously still very possible. I mean, they have to win every single one of these games. It's going to be tough. <laughs> They're going to have to get lucky a little bit. They're going to have to ball bounce your way here and there. All those kinds of things. Paul Mitchell says you're still not going to the Auburn game, Trey. If somebody will fly me to Auburn, I might consider it. And that way I will get a ticket. But I just cannot justify paying all that money to fly to Auburn, to rent a car, to drive halfway, stay in a hotel, drive to Auburn the next day. It's two hours from Atlanta. Sit in the, I wanted to say the S word, but the crappiest seat in college football is the Auburn press box. It's horrendous. They moved it a few years ago. Moved it to the back behind. They only have one big screen. So here's your big screen, and then here's the press box in the end zone. You can't even see a replay. You feel totally disconnected from the game. You're all way super high. You're in the end zone. It just it sucks. It used to be like they used to have a good one. And I'm not saying they have to have put us right in the middle of the field like they used to, on, you know, right above the lower deck. But what they've done is atrocious, and I don't blame – if I were an Auburn beat reporter, I would not go to the games. So, if somebody wants to fly me to Auburn, you live anywhere in Arkansas, I'll come meet you. We'll have a trip together. I'll buy a ticket. I'm not sitting in the press box. I'll buy a ticket, and um, I'll go to the game that way. Otherwise, I'm not going to Auburn. I have boycotted Auburn. Takes me off. The whole trip's difficult. It's like that's the thing about some of these SEC towns. It's just tough to get to some of these small towns. Like if you're covering an NFL team, you just fly right in, fly right out, direct flight. You're leaving from a big city anyway. But up here, you know, it's it's just a little more difficult to get around, especially places like Auburn, Starkville, Oxford. There's not really a good way to get to Oxford, you know. Um, definitely not a good way to get to Auburn, Mississippi State. Columbia, it's only a five-hour drive. It's not too bad. Moise, um, Moise Ukelia is spamming us to want everybody to know how they were cured from herpes. Interesting. Interesting platform to spam us for your – you think a lot of people here have herpes? Why did you pick this one? Hmm. I'm going to leave it up for anybody that has herpes that wants to find out more. <laughs> Dustin Hoofman says, Trey, do you feel like this is a game where they took out the recent frustrations? A little bit. I, I think Arkansas was just better personnel-wise. That's how I felt going into the game, that Arkansas just had better personnel. And if they lost the game, it was going to be a lack of energy, um, not preparing properly, bad coaching decisions, all of those types of things. Will Causey says, how much defense will we get back, if any? I hope we blow out Auburn. So, they're going to get – let's just start in the secondary. They're expecting to get Miles Slusher back, Jaden Johnson, Kari Johnson, Malik Chavez. Is it Chavis or Chavez? I say Chavis forever, but everybody says Chavez, so I guess it's Chavez. Um, expect to get him back to maybe get Bumper Pool a little bit more healthy. Those would all be nice things, wouldn't they? Uh, is anybody else? Kari, Jaden – Miles, am I missing somebody? Chavis, I feel like I'm missing one D back. I mean, Catalan's obviously out for the season. Ladarius Bishop's out for the season. So maybe they can get all those guys back. If they get those guys back, then they can be. You know, they're not. I'm not going to say they're going to be great, but like getting Miles Slusher back is is important. I mean, he's to me easily their best defensive back. Uh, maybe followed by McLaughlin. Josh Smith says life's always better when the Razorbacks win. Certainly easier, isn't it? 
it's almost like I almost feel like instead of like like happy, it's almost like relief, isn't it? <laughs> Isn't that weird how that works? Marco Giles says, Trey, we got to make sure all running backs return next year, especially Dominic Johnson. Not to say that anybody's leaving, but the backfield is so stacked that it's possible to happen. Kevin Deshaun Spencer says, we are, on, we are only a made field goal away from where I thought we'd be, a little perspective. Very good point. Very easily and probably should be 5-2 and two right now. Marco Giles says, also make sure you're wearing some reflectors or bright clothing during your at-home walk and talks at night. <laughs> Thanks for looking out. I had some bright pants and bright shoes on. You just couldn't see it. I was looking out. There wasn't a lot of, wasn't a lot of traffic on that street anyway. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining me. One last time, if you have not subscribed to the page, do so. Hit the notifications bell so you're alerted any up time, anytime we upload new videos. I'm getting to that 50 minute mark where I can barely talk. Um, but subscribe to the page on YouTube if you haven't done so already. Follow us on Facebook. Throw us a like. Throw us a thumbs up. Comment. Share the content with somebody else. Your old papa loves the Razorbacks, but he doesn't know anything about YouTube or the internet. Show him how to get on there. Look, papa. Look at this guy. <laughs> this bald man. He knows what he's talking about. He's going to give you your Razorback news. Help somebody out. Help out an old man. All right, everybody. Leave us a five-star review also. Teach your old papaw how to leave us a review also. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining me. We'll be back with you guys, um, I guess, next Monday. We're not going to do a walk and talk, obviously. Um, we're not doing the show on Thursday because there's no p opponent to a preview. So we're going to take it a, a little easy. I need to regroup a little bit, too. I got a, I got a list of things to do that are so long, like things that I've just been putting on the back burner that have just been building and building because I'm all focused on football. Uh, so I'm going to get to some of those things, and we're going to come back nice and refreshed, just like the Razorback football team. Hit this stretch run of five games. It's an important run. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me. This has been Trey Biddy with Hogsports.com, and we'll catch you next time.